presentation into the story is because it's really it's been an emerging uh, disease issue, uh, an emerging political issue, and it's very much uh, central to uh, a lot of the debate about uh, what harm we may or may not be doing with respect to public health through antimicrobial use in, in animals. So it's very hard now to see a news article that addresses antimicrobial um, use in animals and the risk of human health that at some stage doesn't drop the MRSA word in the middle of it and say, well, here we finally have the smoking gun as such of, of how we link animal use in, uh, of antimicrobials with human health. So uh, I was um, uh, requested by the National Pork Board to, to conduct a review really of what's published in terms of the, the human health risks associated with what are now called the livestock associated uh, MRSA. So what I'll, I'll, I'll talk through now is, is really uh, uh, my view of uh, what's out there in evidence and, and the way the story's unfolding. Uh, because as most things in biology, when people tend to take a very simplistic uh, uh, approach to what's explaining, you know, cause and effect. Uh, biology is very complicated. The more we tend to understand, the more complicated it gets. Um, so what I'm going to touch on here is just a brief overview of the background of, uh, of MRSA in human health and uh, the livestock side. Uh, a little bit of the findings that I put together for the pork board in the white paper and just a, a little bit of preliminary uh, data on a, a study, occupational um, study that we're doing as swine veterinarians, including a couple in the room, uh, that is really, uh, you know, part of the effort to try and understand what it means in terms of human health. Uh, very briefly, for everybody, Staph aureus is one of the first bugs you ever hear about in veterinary school. I know it was the first one I ever saw in a plate. It's been around for a long time. Uh, we'd expect 20 or 30 percent of the people in the room now uh, to be harboring it on their uh, upper respiratory tract considered normal flora. Uh, it's an opportunistic pathogen uh, in people, a very important pathogen, and it covers a very broad spectrum of, uh, of clinical manifestations from a little pimple in the skin through to uh, septicemia and death. Uh, so you get very mild to severe uh, infections. A lot of cases where we get skin soft tissue infections and what are called the invasive manifestations where you get systemic disease, pneumonia, septicemia and death. And there's estimates around of, of the order of you know, 20,000 fatalities a year linked to um, uh, MRSA on its own and a little bit more to Staph aureus in general. So it's an important uh, pathogen. Um, the truth in biology is a moving target, uh, and if we looked at what was the truth about MRSA uh, in the methicillin resistant Staph aureus, it was first detected in 61, and it emerged rapidly across the world, particularly focused in hospitals and uh, wherever there was uh, aged uh, uh, care facilities, chronically ill people in institutions. There was no debate that the resistance problems seen with MRSA and often multiple resistant strains were linked to antimicrobial use in those institutions. It wasn't really seen as a concern for the broader community. So if you were a healthy individual in the street, uh, you weren't considered at risk. Uh, and there was no discussion of any epidemiological role for animals. So it was really a, a major resistance problem linked to human use of antimicrobials in human medical settings. So it wasn't part of the debate. Uh, there has been a couple of what I call quantum shifts in the epidemiology of MRSA. Uh, the first thing was it, it came out of the hospitals and we had the emergence worldwide of what's called community acquired MRSA. So people getting infections outside those institutional settings uh, happen globally uh, and different clones were involved in these community uh, settings than were the typical hospital epidemic strains. So we saw new bugs, new types of bugs appearing and a different epidemiology. The second thing, which is more germane to our discussion, is finding MRSA in animals, food animals, companion animals, horses, exotic animals. And one of my, I often have a quote, you know, uh, from Matthew in the Bible, uh, Seek and you shall find. And when we start looking for more things in these populations, guess what? We tend to uncover them. 
but we have the thing is, okay, it's there, what does it mean? What are the realities? What are the perceptions of zoonotic risk? Um, so I'll just go, for those of you unfamiliar with the, how the story unfolded, it initially happened in Holland, and Holland's a country where they have very strict control of, of MRSA and very low prevalence of MRSA in the general population and in hospitals, uh, and they screened people going in for uh, invasive surgery. Uh, they found three isolates of uh, MRSA that were unusual in people, and, they were, they're three, and the three isolates were very similar, and the people involved were linked to pigs. The index case was a six-month-old uh, baby with a, uh, a congenital heart defect that was going in to have heart surgery, uh, and she was cultured for MRSA before she went in and was positive. So she didn't have an infection. In fact, none of the three had infections. They were all screening cases uh, where they found the bug, uh, and then they saw, what's this link to pigs? Uh, this, again, we had a very distinct, it was an unusual uh, organism. Um, the standard method for typing Staph aureus uh, here in the US, the same method in, uh, in most countries of the world, is using pulse field uh, gel electrophoresis. So chomping up the DNA, looking at the banding patterns, giving them names, and that's what they do to do the, 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 the sort of detective work epidemiology to study spread and where it's coming from. These strains wouldn't digest with the enzyme that they used. So all of a sudden they had no bands, which is why they recognised them and saying, we've got these weird things here, we can't chew them up. Um, the other thing that was done, and, and with Staph aureus, is multiple typing seams, but just for the, the key things, untypable on pulse field gel electrophoresis. There's a method called multi-locus sequence typing, which is sequencing seven different genes, and again, looking at the sequence patterns, and they found that these uh, three isolates that they were getting from the, the three cases all belonged to the same sequence type, which they gave the number ST398. So if you look in literature, you'll often say people are talking about livestock-associated MRSA, others talking about ST398, uh, MRSA, which is, uh, is pretty much considered synonymously, and I'll talk about the perils of that. There's another method that's used very widely called SPAR typing, which is chopping up one uh, Staph aureus specific gene, protein A, that's the SPAR, uh, where it comes from, and again, looking at the sequence patterns uh, of that, and what we see is that uh, it, within the ST398 family, now we've done a lot more work, there's about 30 different SPAR types. So, uh, these livestock uh, isolates are not typable by pulse field. Typically, uh, on MLST, they belong to this uh, broad family of uh, ST398. Within that family, there's a lot of related uh, isolates that are given different type numbers uh, using this, uh, well, there's actually a couple of systems, uh, so we uh, can look at them uh, in a more refined way. So, questions are, these things are there, uh, what are the risks to whom? How can we get, do we face the risks? How frequent are cases likely to occur? How severe are cases? Um, we're dealing, as you guys, uh, and some of you heard me talk about this before, there was a New York Times article on an outbreak of, uh, of livestock, well, theoretically livestock-associated MRSA occurring in Camden, Indiana. Uh, it was a myth. Uh, there was not one case that was actually demonstrated uh, to... Uh, to be infected with any of these organisms, just saying a rumour of an epidemic, and uh, by innuendo association with uh, local pig farms. Uh, there was also a, uh, a, a news break. We faced the blogosphere, and Marin McKenna is uh, uh, an active science journalist blogger who is uh, part of, I'd say, the panic industry and, uh, and predicting that, you know, look what's happening, the end of the world's coming, and she reported uh, on an isolate saying, there was a pig, MRSA, involved in the death of a child. Uh, there was issues there because, uh, one, it wasn't MRSA. It was a Staph aureus a resistant, uh, sorry, susceptible strain, methicillin-resistant strain, and the child had no uh, um, contact with livestock. But that doesn't stop a good story getting out there. So we're in this uh, very emotional environment of uh, an important human pathogen being found in the animal population, uh, and all of a sudden predictions of A, what caused it, which is antimicrobial use in big farms, uh, and B, that it was going to be the one we're waiting for an emerging public health threat uh, uh, that we have created. So. I think uh, we have uh, 
some things that are now generally accepted. One is that there's a pretty common occurrence of these strains of uh, MRSA in livestock populations, not just pigs, multiple species, many countries. Most people, places where people have looked, uh, they've found these organisms. So they are in animal populations. It's also, I think, generally accepted that people working in close contact with animals carrying these organisms have a high prevalence of nasal colonization. So we find the bugs in the noses of the people who are working with these animals. Uh, and some of the numbers in some of these studies, often of the order of 20 to 40 percent. Uh, if we look at our general US population, uh, we would expect maybe one or two people in the room, if this was uh, bank tellers and everyone else other than veterinarians, might be carrying MRSA. Uh, generally, uh, in the farming populations, it's much, much higher, order of magnitude higher. Uh, and lots of studies in veterinarians, both small animal and large animal, veterinarians are certainly at risk for nasal carriage as are farmers working with livestock where the populations carry these organisms. That's a generally accepted fact. The question is, um, you know, what does it mean in terms of actual disease risk rather than having a staph aureus in your nose, which is really meant to be there anyway in many cases. Uh, and it's also established, I believe, that there's very low risk of exposure in other groups. So if, we're, if this is coming to get us, uh, the people who need to be concerned are people working on farms and people like vet, the veterinary profession who are, have a high level of exposure. And I'll get, show you some data uh, a little bit later on that will, I think, uh, uh, ensure that most people probably sleep fairly well tonight. Okay, so we have this issue of occupational exposure, and it's been a consistent observation. Occupational exposure to animals increases the risk of a MRSA positive nasal culture and it's been done, farmers, veterinarians, abattoir workers. Uh, pretty Even at the abattoir level, seems to be pretty much confined to people with live animal exposure rather than further downstream. So it's contact with the live animal environment. So we have this issue, are these individuals actually colonised? What does the definition of colonised mean? Uh, if you're breathing the air in a barn that is being shared by animals breathing the air and they have uh, are exhaling staphorius and we find it in humans' noses, is the human colonised or are we actually culturing uh, dust particles from the air of the barn? Is it an environmental sample or are they colonised? So is it contamination versus whatever we believe colonisation means? If people are colonised, uh, how long does it last? How important is regular animal contact in uh, people maintaining a positive culture status? Uh, what are the consequ consequences of being colonised? Uh, is there elevated infection risk? Uh, is there risk of secondary transmission? And we know with the recent flu stories at the fair that that's a very important question. Uh, if we are indeed picking up organisms from animal reservoirs, what's the probability that will pass them along to other peoples and and uh, get into the broader population. So there's some of the things that <coughs> I tried to try and dig into with this uh, uh, white paper for the pork board. There's a couple of studies done on duration of colonisation. Most of the work's been done in Holland because they've been paying a lot of attention to this. And what they saw with uh, research workers, so got people going onto farms who weren't working on farms but collecting samples, uh, they found uh, that of 199 events of people going to farms, they were culture negative before, they were culture positive after. So, uh, but only one of those 33 retested positive after 24 hours. So for a lot of these positive culture events, it appeared they didn't last for very long. But again, this is a very different scenario than the people who are breathing the air day in, day out. Uh, so evidence suggests that most short-term exposure leads to short-term colonisation. But we only have one or two studies. And here's the other one, which was in veal f uh, farmers. And veal are the other, uh, I guess, livestock uh, group that's uh, been shown to be uh, a little bit higher along with pigs than, than some of the others. Again, same thing. Rapid de decline in prevalence during absence of animal contact. Uh, and the conclusion here that these livestock uh, MRSA are poor persistent colonisers in most humans. So that's really all we have on colonisation uh, this far. Uh, there's been studies done in Holland where they've found, uh, and they track MRSA very carefully. In fact, they swab you in just about all sorts of places if you're going into hospital there, um, and study secondary transmission. 
So when they had uh, looked at livestock variant MRSA versus, you know, garden variety human MRSA, uh, they reported it was about six times less likely to generate a secondary case. Uh, so, and made to the conclusion that actually the spreading capacity per admission may be insufficient to lead to an, an epidemic. And an epidemic, in their words, is not an epidemic of a disease, it's an epidemic of colonization. Um, one other study, pretty much the same thing, found, uh, talk about it, they described it the other way, but nosocomial transmission of the ST398 was about 72% less likely than in other strains. Pretty much same ballpark. So the two studies we had of transmission both showed that in the hospital environment, these bugs were less likely to be transmitted from one person uh, to the next. Um, the next thing is a little bit more. So that's what were the colonization part, but what about the disease part? What do we know about that? Um, and in the work we did uh, for the pork board, we tried to find all published reports of livestock associated MRSA that had any uh, discussion of clinical cases. A lot of the papers just define culture positive. They've done screening, they found it, it's in their nose, whatever that means. So we focused on papers where there was at least one as association of a culture with clinical disease. Um, we didn't uh, include studies that were just said, okay, we found it in colonization. We don't know whether any of those cases are diseases. But so we tried to get all the information, um, both with MRSA and MSSA. So these ST398 organisms can be methicillin resistant or not. And in fact, in Minnesota, uh, from the pig reservoir, most of, well, all the ones we found have actually been uh, methicillin sensitive, but still belonging to this livestock group. And we were trying to get uh, a picture of, you know, what, what is the damage. Uh, one of the difficult things, a lot of the European literature, they don't distinguish colonization from infection. One thing is for certain is that there's been a, a relatively small number of serious infections. In those serious infections, many cases, there's no livestock contact. And I'll come back to that a little because it's, it's important. Um, there was one reported uh, fatality. There's now five. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, in terms of what's been done in North America, uh, there's one study published in Canada where they went back and looked at their, their library of, uh, of, of MRSA isolates. And out of 4,000, they found five ST398 isolates Four of them were skin soft tissue infections, so not invasive infections, uh, and they, uh, there was no detail on the, on the other one. So generally, a very small number uh, in Canada. Uh, the CDC, we have no publications from the, from the public health authorities, uh, but uh, CDC uh, at meetings that I've attended uh, have looked at over 12,000, uh, this was a year ago, isolates in the USA, have not found one in a clinical case from a human being. Uh, Minnesota Department of Health, uh, Kirk Smith, told me they've looked at 7,000 isolates. So we got a lot of pigs in Minnesota. A lot of their surveillance comes from the urban areas. So I, I would be confident there are cases of these organisms causing infections out there in the world. They're just not getting in, uh, probably partly because there's not many of them, partly because they're not necessarily severe. Uh, I wouldn't argue there's nothing out there. Uh, it's just it hasn't, it's not, significant enough to have been detected by our existing surveillance systems. Um, what we did find was 83 papers where there was some associated clinical cases. Uh, some of those, most of the isolates were screening samples. Uh, the data we tried to get out of it were available, or what country was it in, how many isolates were screening, how many isolates were from clinical in infections and what were the clinical presentations with respect to whether they bacteremia, pneumonia, skin soft tissue infection, uh, uh, whether they were invasive, whether they were deaths. And the other things, any history of animal contact fatalities. Uh, then we added them up and said, okay, of all these things that have been reported, how many are invasive? And invasive, we were very generous. We call them invasive if there was a bacteremia, which is obviously good, a pneumonia, uh, but also in other sites, Urine sputum isolates. You can, you can argue that sputum is hardly invasive, but in most of those cases they were looking at, at severe respiratory disease. Uh, so I try, I didn't want to leave anything out. So I'm presenting what I think is a, is a worst case scenario of the, uh, the burden of disease here. Um, this is what we see from, and these again, from the papers where 
they spoke of clinical disease. So you can see the vast majority of the isolates were screening isolates in those papers. Uh, there was a bunch, the 193 there were clinical miscellaneous, so all sorts of things. 213, the biggest part of the clinical ones were unspecified. So it was a clinical case, but there was no information as to whether it was an abscess on their little finger or whether they had uh, they got it out of their blood. Uh, and you can see uh, invasive, 84 cases. And, and you can think this is a, a six, seven year period globally publication. And you can say, well, what about all the cases weren't, that weren't published? Um, I don't think we've missed too many of those simply because, I mean, there's a paper published on the isolation of one of these isolates from the uh, nose of a childcare worker in Iowa with no uh, clinical disease. So it was worthy of publication when you can get an, uh, uh, one individual with a positive nose swab. Uh, so we're not missing much, I think, at this early stage of, of severe clinical disease and five fatal cases. And I'll talk more about those five fatal cases. Um, what else might be going on out there? Kerry Liedem Larson um, looked at self-reported disease in US swine farmers, did a survey uh, and asked people from... Uh, got 135 replies from pork producers, and five of the respondents reported a history of uh, physician-diagnosed MRSA skin soft tissue uh, in, um, infections. Time period unclear. This would be a, considered a lifetime risk until this point in time. So lots of years of exposure, 3.7%, uh, you can say, is it a big number or, 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 or a small number? It's not a frightening number uh, if these people are genuinely at risk. Uh, but none of them had any bacterial uh, logical uh, information, so we don't know if there was any livestock-associated uh, cases. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think that that number is probably a whole lot uh, different from what we'd expect in the general population. This is uh, some data from uh, a couple of European studies that I'll show you now, where they looked at data from national and nine national regional laboratories in seven countries, and these are all countries where these organisms have been found and are relatively, so you've got Holland, you've got Germany, high pig production uh, uh, countries where these we know these organisms are fairly common. Uh, and if we look at the... Uh, Overall, the total numbers you can see on this side, these are our, our livestock ones. We've got 113 uh, out of uh, the others, 3,435. So they're only a couple of percent of all the MRSA cases. So even in these hog-dense areas, they're not really causing most of your problem. More telling is when we look at, say, okay, let's look at our blood, which is basically our invasive infections. And you can see, actually, there's a significantly different uh, difference there in the proportions with uh, uh, about, one, again, one-fifth uh, as prevalent uh, in invasive infections. So, again, more information that your garden variety MRSA rather than your animal-associated MRSA are more likely to be associated with invasive disease. So evidence that they are less um, uh, pathogenic, perhaps, than uh, than what's in the general human population. Uh, another geographic study from, uh, from Europe, look at this one, 357 laboratories, 450 hospitals in 26 countries. You can see basically the core of Western Europe there. And they looked at uh, two, you know, almost 3,000 MSSA and MRSA isolates from the invasive infections. So we're just here on serious clinical disease. What they found? was ST398 in 12 cases, so 1.3% of their invasive cases. The interesting thing at the bottom, none of them were MRSA. All of these invasive cases were methicillin-susceptible uh, Staph aureus. Uh, and we won't get into the why that is, just to point out that the livestock-associated MRSA are apparently a very, very small part of the picture of invasive serious disease in these European hospitals, even in areas in hog-dense countries where we know these organisms are probably more prevalent than they are in North America. Uh, so public health risk, current evidence uh, that I can find suggests lower transmissibility, no reports of outbreaks. Current evidence suggests relatively low virulence based on this uh, relatively uh, uh, low occurrence of invasive disease. Um, serious infections uh, have not been common, only eight or so. There's people looking at molecularly for virulence determinants. 
They've pretty, every study pretty much has shown that these livestock variants lack most of the known human staph aureus virulence factors. So they're not loaded with all the things that we recognize as, as determinants of, uh, of severe disease. Uh, and we've yet to see any documentation of elef elevated infection risk uh, in the farm worker uh, group relative to the general population. So we certainly have an elevated exposure risk. Uh, I don't, I'm waiting on the next uh, DANMAP report from uh, Denmark, which should be out soon, and they're tracking this fairly closely and, and seeing, uh, I think their results so far have been consistent about this. I now just want to look at the fatalities. There's been five fatal cases linked to ST398 infections. Four of them have been MSSA. So again, this, the MRSA being less than the methicillin susceptible variants. The really interesting thing is that four of them are this SPA type. If you remember the, the, uh, when a more refined look within the family of ST398, we have a 30 odd SPA types. This SPA type T571 is relatively uncommon in pigs, probably less than 1% of the isolates, but four out of the four here were types 571 in, in humans, and these four cases had no significant livestock contact. So it's getting harder to join the dots. If we get excited about these four fatalities and blaming the livestock industry, well, there's no contact. And the bug there uh, isn't a MRSA. Uh, and it is of a spa type that is uncommon in pigs. Uh, there was one case of a death with livestock co uh, contact and with an isolate, a, a spa type common in swine, and the victim was a 85-year-old man with lung carcinoma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. They grew the organism from the pleural fluids in his chest. Uh, so you can get into your own arguments about the causal importance of that infection in, the, in that death. So really what we've seen in terms of livestock uh, fatalities attributable to livestock exposure in healthy people, the number remains zero after about uh, five or six years. That, I think, is good news. Uh, and we have this issue of uh, the MSSA science. Um, how are we going for time, Craig? Um, I've got time. Um, I mentioned before about this one report, uh, four minutes, OK, I'll have to scoot on, um, about this case in a previous, so a sudden death due to pneumonia in a previously healthy 14-year-old girl, girl, a very tragic outcome. Again, MSSA type 571. Uh, I won't get into that. It was tetracycline susceptible. Just about every isolate from pigs has been uh, tetracycline resistant. And you can argue whether that's good or bad, but it argues against a pig source. Uh, methicillin susceptible, as I mentioned, no livestock uh, contact. Uh, and this is what we're dealing with. This is a peer-reviewed publication, and the inference for the people public, uh, writing this is saying, the spread of ST398 is a matter of concern because strains of the sequence type were able to acquire the PBL genes, which are a virulence marker for community-acquired strains. Uh, no discussion of the possibility that, that actually pigs may not have been involved in this strain and the fact that it was an MSSA strain. So leaping to the conclusions that if we grow these organisms, uh, the pigs are going to be to blame. Uh, and again, concern because strains were able to acquire them, but livestock strains are almost universally tetracycline resistant. Ta SPA type 571 is uncommon in animal isolates. Uh, so we've got this question, uh, two questions. One is, if these organisms get into human, in animal populations, is that associated with loss of their virulence attributes? There's a lot of evidence to su suggest that's the case from both cattle and uh, poultry strains. And the other one, more importantly, uh, we tend to uh, equate ST398 uh, staph aureus with livestock. And that's just been because of the way the story unfolded. But we've got this issue of could some variants be uh, persist without any role of, of livestock? Uh, I'll just flip through this and just say, actually, there's actually a bunch of papers now all reporting on T571 uh, in different scenarios with uh, unlikely or no apparent livestock content. So in some areas, in fact, in China, uh, it was the most common spa type in Beijing uh, in the city uh, of uh, MSSA infections. 
So it appears that there is a reservoir of ST398s that are probably circulating in human populations. There's, there's more information from this. This is where I'm getting back to the complexity. ST398 animals coming to humans, the story is more complicated uh, than that. Uh, and more so in, in France, I did some fairly uh, good work looking at some of these T571 strains and then compared them with uh, some of the pig-borne strains. Uh, and what they found is that the 30 isolates were genetically distinct, different, related, but different to the pig uh, strains that they looked at, but very similar to some of the strains from humans in China uh, and also some US strains. Uh, and we get back to this question that we've got some diversity in this family of 398 organisms that is a little bit um, um, more complex than we believe in, and uh, it, the story's still unfolding. Uh, so implications, I think, there's no way this is good news for the livestock industries because it's, it's cannon fodder uh, for people opposing the, the industry. Uh, I think where we should be focusing our effort is in occupational risk because if anyone's uh, on the front line in this, it is the producers and the veterinarians, uh, slaughter horse, uh, slaughterhouse workers, but particularly producers and veterinarians. Uh, what we should be doing in industry attention to personal hygiene, uh, management of you know, things like showers, sharing items, sharing clothing, uh, most importantly, uh, wound treatment and covering. So you mean people get scratches and, and all sorts of things in livestock facilities. Just general awareness that the right thing to do is clean the wound, cover the wound, go back to work, don't panic. If uh, there's any signs of infection, seek medical treatment. So just maybe a little bit more common uh, emphasis on the common sense rather than, oh, I've cut my hand, it's got a bit of feces in it, I'll just go keep going eating the lunch, which is the sort of thing I used to do when I was a practitioner. <laughs> um, I just want to um, touch now on a, on a couple of things, a couple of work, bit of work we're doing here. We're having all this discussion on MRSA in pigs without knowing anything about Staph aureus in pigs. So we're just completing now a, a study trying to understand Staph aureus generally in terms of how it's operating in pig populations and Leticia Linearis is in here is, is just finishing up her masters on that. So we're hoping to get that work out and published uh, and certainly uh, presented here by next year. Um, what we have also going on is a funding through, uh, through NIOSH. We have a, a new center for occupational uh, safety and health research here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Liz was involved in, in getting that funded. Uh, I'm uh, uh, running uh, one study really with two components. Uh, we're doing a longitudinal study of swine veterinarians. We're going to swab them monthly for uh, 18 months. I'm now christening them uh, teen nostril. There's a couple of them in the year. So they're sending me a swab every month plus some information on animal exposure and we're looking at what unfolds in terms of does anyone get infections? What's the rate of exposure? And we also have a, uh, a broader survey of occupational health and safety in swine veterinarians. I just want to touch on you with the uh, high prevalence of colonization. So what we've seen with Team Nostril, we've just got swabs in from two months. So a very high prevalence. Remember the general population is 20 to 30 percent. So in, uh, in two months we're running uh, of the order of 60 percent. So at least double the general population. Our MRSA numbers are pretty much in line with what's seen in veterinary populations. So again, uh, a several fold higher than the general population. We're seeing a mix of spa types. We are finding uh, livestock associated spa types in, group, in both groups and uh, uh, really uh, appreciate the great support I'm getting from the, from the vets in that they're, they're engaged and we're managing to, I just got to keep them engaged for another 16 months. But, uh, and this is what we've seen uh, uh, on the survey side. We've asked the, you know, and these are results from 117 veterinarians. Have they ever had a methicillin resistant Staph aureus infection? We've actually had a couple. Have they ever had a methicillin resistant um, a susceptible Staph aureus infection? And you can see most of these 117 veterinarians reporting are saying no. They may not have perfect memories anymore, like me. Uh, out of this population of 117, we've got two MRSA cases more than 3,000 vet years at risk. And we ask them if they've had an infection, did they go to hospital, did they miss work? We have one day of lost work in that uh, 3,000 veterinary years. So uh, currently our history, and we can say this was before, this was before uh, this disease emerged. So most of those vet years, we might argue, we didn't know it was there. We don't know whether it was, it wasn't, but certainly 
uh, there's not much uh, to be concerned about historically uh, with what's gone on in our, our veterinary population and with the prospect of study where at least it'll be a lot shorter and less people, we, uh, I think I'll be surprised if we don't uh, find something that's something consistent with that. My last, this is my plug, uh, that study, the survey part is ongoing. Uh, we're trying to, we've got a, uh, identified a population of about 400 US wine veterinarians we've contacted. We've got so far, oops, uh, 132 respondents, which isn't bad, but we're wanting to get, at least get to, uh, to 200, hopefully 250. So if you're a US swine vet, help us out. Uh, if you're on our list, you're getting regular reminders. Um, we know you're busy. The survey, it's a one-off gear. Most people are doing it in 15, 20 minutes, so you'll help us out. The more representative we can get uh, this data to be, the more argument we can carry about where the risks are.